By quite a long way, Liz Truss has become Britain's most short-lived Prime Minister. We all got the news at 1.30pm with this rather short statement. I came into office at a time of great economic and international instability. Families and businesses were worried about how to pay their bills. Putin's illegal war in Ukraine threatens the security of our whole continent. And our country has been held back for too long by low economic growth. I was elected by the Conservative Party with a mandate to change this. We delivered on energy bills and on cutting national insurance. And we set out a vision for a low tax, high growth economy that would take advantage of the freedoms of Brexit. I recognise though, given the situation, I cannot deliver the mandate on which I was elected by the Conservative Party. I have therefore spoken to His Majesty the King to notify him that I am resigning as leader of the Conservative Party. This morning I met the chairman of the 1922 committee, Sir Graham Brady. We've agreed that there will be a leadership election to be completed within the next week. This will ensure that we remain on a path to deliver our fiscal plans and maintain our country's economic stability and national security. I will remain as Prime Minister until a successor has been chosen. Thank you. Fair play to her. She did well to keep smiling. I think that's the, the least we could say. It was notable, she said, that her replacement would be chosen within a week. So we'll come back to that in one moment. What is going to happen next? First of all, though, I'm joined by Ash Sarkar and Aaron Bastani. Um, and I want to know from Aaron first, how humiliating is this? It's very humiliating, Michael. She's been in office um, as Tory leader for 45 days. She's been prime minister for 44 days. The previous record holder is George Canning, who was prime minister for more than twice as long. He died in office. So on a personal level, it is humiliating. Liz Truss will be in the history books for possibly centuries. <laughs> and I, I, think, I think it's very hard to foresee how somebody um, outdoes her here. So, of course, it's personally humiliating for her, but more for the Conservative Party. And this is what matters, I suppose, for our, our audience and the electorate, is that the, the Conservative Party look completely unmoored from reality. Um, they only have bad options now. That wasn't the case when they had the leadership election this summer. You know, they were, they were, they were trailing Labour by eight, ten points. But they had a range of candidates. It was, it was quite plausible. And I, I heard this from people I spoke to, you know, in the Conservative Party. They can be hung parliament. Maybe even we'll keep a small majority. That clearly is no longer being said. And I think it's inarguable that there's never been this kind of political capsision, if that is a word, when something turns upside down so fundamentally in politics. And remarkably, so much of it was entirely avoidable. Liz Trust could have done a very boring mini budget with Quasi Kwarteng. They could have just done, you know, price caps on energy or, or making sure that bills didn't massively increase on where they were right now. And she would have got a significant amount of political capital from it. She would have had something of a honeymoon simply from not being Boris Johnson, but her and Kwasi Kwarteng and the, the coterie of right-wing um, ideologues and economists around her decided not to do that. They made a very big bet and boy, they lost badly. Ash, I want to bring Ash in on this humiliation question. And I suppose, you know, Liz Truss said only yesterday, she's a fighter, not a quitter. Is this her quitting? I mean, obviously, you know, there was some degree of her being forced to resign, but do you think she could have possibly hung on any longer or did she just decide, look, everyone wants me to go. There's no way I can I can fight this anymore. Look, she said yesterday that she's a fighter, not a quitter. But if there's one thing that Prime Minister Liz Truss is known for, it is a swift and panicky U-turn. So I'm not surprised that she backed down on that one. I think it was pretty clear after last night's total and utter clusterfuck in the voting lobbies, that her authority as prime minister is completely shot and indeed irreparable. You had that one-two punch of Suella Braverman being, I would guess, you know, it was a non-consensual resignation, let's put it that way. Um, and her letter to the prime minister, which was made public, 
was in short, well, fine, if you hoist me out of the tent, I've got no choice but to direct my piss inside it. So she made an enemy of someone who was once a firm ally and an insider. The second thing is with Wendy Morton and the deputy chief whip as well, resigning and then not resigning, the fact that the prime minister wasn't even able to vote in the fracking bill, which she described, which had been briefed as essentially a confidence vote in her government. There was no way that she could continue after that. And Aaron's right. All of this was totally avoidable. And the reason why I think Liz Truss made such excessively stupid decisions is that one, she is a bear of very little brain. I've said this from the start, which is she is an exceptionally untalented politician, lacking even the charisma of Boris Johnson um, and lacking the you know basic political nous of uh, Theresa May. And I think that she was a product of a Tory party which had become intensely hubristic because they'd been able to enjoy such impunity for so long, merrily skipping from one self-made disaster from another, whether that was austerity or Brexit or Boris Johnson. She thought that that meant that they were invisible. And of course, what her mini budget did was endanger the economic interests of the very people who turn out to vote Conservative homeowners and pensioners. The issue wasn't that she made the country poorer. George Osborne did that. And he and David Cameron, were it not for the Brexit referendum of 2016, I think would have been quite likely to win a third term together. Um, the problem was, is that she machine gunned the Conservatives' most reliable voters. She was never, ever going to survive having done that. Yes, you, you mentioned that vote um, last night in Parliament on fracking. Now, we were giving you live updates that was going through on last night's show. Afterwards, um, what became apparent is the reason Liz Truss didn't vote in a vote, which, as Ash said, she had called a confidence vote in her own government, is because she was too busy trying to persuade the chief whip not to resign. So they were sort of at loggerheads. She's telling the chief whip not to resign. The chief whip wants to resign. And in the, the fracas, um, neither of them vote for what they had both been saying was a confidence vote in their own government. It's a complete chaos. Um, and that does seem to have been the sort of the final tipping point. I mean, obviously, for, for quite a long time now, I think since last Friday, when you had that complete U-turn on all of, um, you know, quasi Quartengo's hunt is in. I think that was the moment at which people thought, okay, this is definitely over and it's going to end soon. But I think it was those events in Parliament yesterday, which meant people, we can't wait a couple of weeks to have a more sort of smooth succession. What we need to do is get rid of her now because this cannot go on. Um, as Aaron said, Liz Truss becomes the shortest serving prime minister in history. Um, so she lasted 45 days. Um, the next shortest is George Canning at 119. As Aaron said, he died in office. Um, so this is very, very exceptional the length of this tenure. And in those 45 days, to be fair to her, it was it was an eventful one. The Queen died, the pound crashed, the Chancellor resigned, and then so did the Home Secretary. So, you know, it, it was it was a 45 days that she fit a lot in. She packed a lot in that short space of time. But now it's over and the leadership election to replace Truss is apparently going to be very swift. Truss indicated it will end within a week. But the final decision as to the timetable lies with the Conservative Party board, which is meeting later this afternoon. Graham Brady, as well as being chair of the 1922 committee, sits on that board. And this is what he said to TV cameras soon after Liz Truss resigned. I have spoken to the party chairman, Jake Berry, and he has confirmed that it will be possible uh, to conduct a ballot and conclude a leadership election uh, by Friday the 28th of October. So we should have a new leader in place before the fiscal statement, which will take place on the 31st. Uh, I'll be able to give you more details later on this afternoon. So will, will, will members be included in the process? Well, that is the expectation. Uh, so uh, the reason I've spoken to the party chairman and uh, discussed the parameters of a uh, process uh, is to look at how we can make the whole thing happen, uh, including uh, the, the party uh, being consulted uh, by Friday next week. Do you accept this as a complete dumpster? 
it's, um, it, it's certainly not a circumstance I would wish to see. So, Graham, will you have to make the threshold for nominations really high in order to flush out candidates? You just can't waste time with this stuff, can you? I, I think these are uh, details that will be clear later on. Uh, I don't, haven't got any more details to share with you now, but there will be some clarity and later this afternoon. how disappointed are you? Just, just one more question. How disappointed are you in this? This is the fourth third Prime Minister in four months. The public must be looking at this thinking, what on earth is going on? This is the governing party. Absolutely. And and, uh, absolutely. And I, I think we are deeply conscious uh, okay. of the imperative in the national interest of resolving this uh, clearly. And quickly. So there will not just be a general election, Sir Graham. There will not just be a general election. How can uh, you continue to uh, keep clearly, the next clearly prime isn't a matter. Uh, isn't a matter for me. Will there definitely be two candidates going forward to the membership? Uh, the uh, party rules say there will be two candidates unless there is only one candidate. So if somebody uh, drops out, if somebody drops out, it could only be one. If there is only one candidate, there is only one candidate. Uh, Do you expect that, that to happen? I, I really can't give you any more that, detail. Whose idea, Sir so Graham, was it to have this contest? Truncated to one week. Was it Liz Truss's idea, or was it your proposal? I think uh, I think it's a, a matter on which there is a pretty broad consensus. So Graham Brady has a very important role in deciding how this is going to work. What did we learn there? So what we knew already um, is that there was agreement. Obviously, Liz Truss had met with Graham Brady and the party chair and the deputy prime minister before making her resignation speech. That was obviously all agreed then. So it's confirmed then um, that they want to have a new leader by next Friday. What was new, um, what we learned from that interview was that he expects, Graham Brady expects members to have a say. So some people were assuming that what they would do is try and change the leadership role change the leadership rules, sorry, so that members didn't get a say at all. So it was just decided purely um, by the Conservative Party MPs. Obviously, the short timetable means that would have to be a much shorter process than the one that happened this summer. They were having hustings for weeks this summer. I think presumably this would have to be that the MPs whittled it down to two and then it goes to some sort of online ballot where they get 48 hours. Obviously, I'm just, you know, this is hypothetical, but I can't see how else it could work. And he also there said it could be one or two candidates going through to the final round. Obviously, if it's only one, then the membership don't have a meaningful vote because they just say yes, yes or no, um, or presumably get locked out of it. So he's saying it could be one, could be two. And then there was no comment on what the threshold would be um, to enter the race. There was a suggestion that one way you could get only one candidate is to say the threshold for even entering the contest is to get 150 MPs or something that would be very difficult for more than one candidate to get at which point you would have only one person eligible to stand and they would then automatically win. Um, Ash, I want to go to you on this. As I say, we don't actually have many details, so it would be a bit unfair to say how is this going to work, but I suppose how could this work? And is there a danger if they try to cut out any meaningful input from Conservative Party members? Well, let's look at what happened the last time the Conservative Party tried to cut out that meaningful input from party members. That was with the effective coronation of Theresa May shortly after David Cameron had to resign after losing the Brexit referendum in 2016. The membership were utterly mutinous. And that combination of a dissatisfied membership and also, I think, a very febrile mood on the back benches where ambitious MPs, the likes of Boris Johnson and Jeremy Hunt and Michael Gove, realised that her authority as a prime minister and a party leader was very weak. And if her attempts to get Brexit done, in her words, um, were frustrated that there would be an opportunity for someone else to become party leader and de facto prime minister. And that was, of course, what Boris Johnson did. Where the membership did have meaningful choices uh, was when you had the contest between Jeremy Hunt and Boris Johnson and Rishi Sunak and Liz Truss. And on both occasions, the membership went for... uh, (laughs) Candidates who spoke to, I think, their heart's desire, but had huge problems with their own personal judgment, whether that's Boris Johnson's lack of personal integrity or Liz Truss, 
her inability to form even the most basic of sentences. So I can see why Tory MPs would be thinking in the name of steadying the ship, they would need to cut out a membership whose collective judgment has been so disastrous on two consecutive occasions. But that that doesn't come without a significant political cost. Aaron, any particular thoughts on this? What, what would you do if you happen to sit on the Conservative Party board, as difficult to imagine as that might be? I would beg, I would get on my knees and beg Rishi Sunak to run for leader and ensure he wins and pray that we get 30% in a general election, because right now that's, that's looking like an outstanding result for the Conservative Party. I think they do probably need to change their ambitions and objectives. They need to elect a leader now who ensures they don't see utter historic decimation in the next general election. It's not about forming a government. I mean, ideally, they don't, they don't even succumb to what they get in 1997 when they reduced a few of them 200 seats. I mean, that would, again, be outstanding. I don't think any of them can do that. I think they've only got bad options, but I think the least worst option is Rishi Sunak. I think Johnson is probably the second best option for them, which tells you how bad this whole thing is. People can talk about Penny Mordaunt and Ben Wallace. These are untested people. You know, Liz Truss was untested. Look what happened. Theresa May was moderately untested. She was Home Secretary, but she hadn't really had the, the spotlight shone on her. Look what happened. Quickly, in terms of how Tory MPs might try and denigrate their members, all the media might do that. It's important to remember Boris Johnson had 51% of Tory MPs in 2019, I believe. You know, so they had the fullest confidence this man could deliver. He did in a general election, but he, he wasn't best suited uh, to administer the country, as we as we found out very quickly over over 2020, so I, I would I would be very surprised if it's not Rishi Sunak, Michael, simply because they now have to be very very risk averse. Liz Truss was a very risk loving choice. You know, I, I put this in a piece I wrote shortly before the the Tory leadership race. I said the obvious candidates are Penny Mordaunt and Ben Wallace, but they have to be very staid. Sunak as well. The problem is, Michael, this is, a, this is a political party now in terms of its media, in terms of its personal in parliament, in terms of its potential leadership cadre, in complete meltdown, and who don't really agree with each other on very much. Um, and that has obviously been a very slow burning process, but you're really seeing it come to the fore now. People like Boris Johnson, who who had a great deal of confidence in Liz Truss, I mean, he called the, the mini budget the best budget since 1986. Quite funny now in retrospect. Um, people like him were, were perfectly happy to back the Tories when it was Boris Johnson, when it was Kwasi Kwarteng, when it was Liz Truss. But now they're not. And it is important to say in 2015, you know, the Tories lost about, well, they still obviously won a majority, but UKIP got the best part of 4 million votes in that election. Now, a new party to their right isn't going to do that in a general election. Uh, I doubt it would even win a single seat. But I think if you did have Jeremy Hunt or Sunak leading the Tories into the next general election, there would certainly be a decent-ish effort from people to their right um, attacking the Conservative Party, which reintroduces that dynamic all over again. So... They've got no good options. And I, like I say, I think the best bet is Rishi Sunak. He can, of course, appeal to the modern 21st century BAME candidate thing. Um, but they're really screwed, Michael. Right now, you're looking at effectively sort of three parties sandwiched into one. Free market, ultra right wing ideologues, the sort of one nation Tories who don't really keep their, you know, don't open their mouths and keep their heads down. Uh, and then you have people fundamentally who probably actually just probably think, well, I've actually got more in common with Keir Starmer than I do with Kwasi Kwarteng or, or Liz Truss. And again, that's a decent chunk of them. So it's very hard to see the Conservative Party really sort this out in office. Even in opposition, I think it would take them a very, very, very long time. It would take an extraordinary act. Actually, let me reformulate that. It would take an unprecedented act of political leadership to turn this around in office and for them not to be decimated in the next general election. Let's talk about the Boris Johnson question. Um, so Stephen Swinford, who is, I think, political editor at the Times, or at least a, a journalist at the Times, he tweeted, exclusive, I'm told that Boris Johnson is expected to stand in the Tory leadership contest. He's taking soundings, but is said to believe it is a matter of national interest. 
Now that is a sentence I don't think anyone in the country is going to believe whether or not they want Boris Johnson to be prime minister. Um, he is at the moment holidaying um, with his wife in the Caribbean. So it's a, a, a case of, is he going to be flying back to stand in this election? And we can now, I think, go to the latest odds. They have been moving around very quickly. So we're going to go to them live. So Rishi Sunak is the favourite. He's on five to six. Penny Morden is on 11 to five. Boris Johnson is on five to one. So Boris Johnson is by quite a long way the third favourite. So Rishi Sunak is still um, odds on to become the next prime minister. Aaron, I suppose a question here, does Rishi Sunak have too many enemies to become the next prime minister? You clearly think that's sort of in the interest of the Conservative Party. Do you think that, you know, people who would before have put personal grudges to the fore or ideological differences to the fore now will just choose, and I'm talking about MPs here more than members, they will just choose whoever think is going to avoid decimation at the next general election? You presume so. I mean, this is, you know, look how much has changed in 50 days, right? You've gone from who do I find ideologically congruent Who's most likely to enhance my my chances for career progression? That's all gone out of the window, Michael. Now it is, who, who is the best bet for me to keep my cushy job as an MP with my expenses, with the nice salary, with the status, and I get to walk into this majestic uh, building four days a week at the Houses of Parliament in Westminster? That's what they'll be thinking. Um, and it's it's very hard... <laughs> to see who else tops Rishi Sunak when you're having that conversation. I'm sure for a cluster of new seats that won in 2019, they probably think, you know what, realistically, we're not really going to keep these regardless. And if we do, maybe a sort of Houdini act from Boris Johnson is the only way it happens. But no, I mean, Sunak is the only one that can guarantee large numbers of these people. Not guarantee, that's a huge word. We've got polls saying they go down to 20 seats. Sunak is the only candidate who makes it more likely that large numbers of these MPs keep their seats. And of course, it's not just the MPs, it's their advisors, it's people that work in their offices. This is existential for large numbers of Tory party members. For councillors, you know, you've got local elections in May, a lot of Tory councillors out there know they won't have those positions after May next year, they're gone. And that's a big, that's a big chunk, chunk of the Tory membership as well. I mean, it's important to say, Michael, we've seen polling out in the last two days, where basically, trust, who didn't actually didn't have a commanding majority anyway in the leadership race uh, two months ago, <clears throat> or a little more than a month ago, not even two months ago. That's actually been capsized. So I think there was some polling that showed Rishi Sunak with a 60-40 lead. Rishi Sunak, of course, even the first time, won more MPs than trusted. So I wouldn't buy the argument that he's made too many enemies within sort of the Westminster party or you know the membership would be an uproar and furious. I think that, that sort of fragment of the Tory vote and it's outriders, the pro-Brexiteers, the free marketeers, you know, minimal state. We love the IEA. That's much louder on social media, and it's much more prominent on your TV screen because it's elevated by the likes of the BBC and LBC and ITV and Sky News than it is in reality. Fundamentally, these people want to stay as MPs, as councillors. Fundamentally, the activists out there don't want a Labour government. And I think it's inarguable the best person for that and he still really is very unlikely to achieve it, is Rishi Sunak. And his, I mean, that's reflected in the odds, you know. You've got, like you say, Boris Johnson at five to one, but Sunak, for now, uh, five to six on. So, overwhelming favourite. I think Penny Mordon, I just don't, I don't get it. You know, you've, you've done, I mean, this might come across as me sort of attacking the Tory women, oh God. You've had two, you've had two untested Tory prime ministers in Theresa May and in Liz Truss, who were really hyped up um, and they've they failed, hyped up by different people and to different extents, but they were really untested politicians. Boris Johnson had been the mayor of London. He'd won twice. He'd fronted a national campaign to, to leave the European Union. I, I don't think you could really put them in the same bracket. And the same with Penny Mordaunt. The idea that she would become the prime minister. I mean, I, I don't know how many people even, her national re name recognition, what is it? You know, Rishi Sunak is, is uh, associated with the furlough scheme. <clears throat> Not all associations are good, by the way. But it's very hard to see how you can be the third prime minister in a single calendar year and walk into Den Downing Street with a certain amount of you know, brand awareness amongst the wider electorate, which is what would be the case with Penny Morden. So yeah, I think it has to be. It has to be. People, I think some people in the comments go, are you supporting Sunak? No. Michael asked me at the top of the show, if you were involved in the process as a senior Tory, as a senior Tory sort of uh, member of the 1922 committee, who would you want? Clearly, Sunak. Clearly. 
I actually think Johnson's probably a better bet than Penny Mordaunt as well, but I think they'd both be awful in all likelihood. Um, this is from the Guardian live feed. Penny Morden is taking soundings from colleagues on whether to stand as leader. So that's Sky who are reporting that. It's thought that the Justice Secretary, Brandon Lewis, is considering running and allies of Rishi Sunak say he is certain to stand. So lots of people seem to be throwing their hats into the ring. Um, a tweet from a Boris Johnson ally. He was a former PPS to Boris Johnson, parliamentary private secretary. He says, I hope you enjoyed your holiday, boss. Time to come back. Few issues at the office that need addressing. Hashtag bring back Boris. James Dudderidge, that was. Um, let's look at what Keir Starmer has had to say about today's event. This is not just a soap opera at the top of the Tory party. It's doing huge damage to our economy and to the reputation of our country. And the public are paying with higher prices, with higher mortgages. So we can't have a revolving door of chaos. We can't have another experiment at the top of the Tory party. There is an alternative, and that's a stable Labour government. And the public are entitled to have their say. And that's why there should be a general election. It's Keir Starmer calling for a general election. I mean, not... Surprising, he wants one. Um, I'm not actually sure if we have seen polling on whether the public want one. I mean, clearly there, there's not much enthusiasm for the continuation of a Tory government. Um, Aaron, Ash, who wants this? Is there any chance whatsoever that we will get a general election, I suppose, before Christmas, let's say? Let's go with you, Ash. Well, I think the Daily Mail, I think the Daily Mail put it best. Um, the Conservative Party, in its current state, voting for a general election wouldn't just be like turkeys voting for Christmas. It would be like turkeys stuffing themselves with butter and preheating the oven as well. Um, there is not a political incentive for the Conservative Party to call a general election while the economy is in the state it is and their polling is so low. And unless you have a simple majority in Parliament, that's not going to happen. All right. And, and, and I don't think that the Conservative Party, as it stands, are likely to call a general election. Some things might change that. One thing that might change that would be the stability of any government which is formed after Liz Truss leaves office. Will they be able to put a cabinet together? Will that cabinet be able to enjoy the confidence of backbench MPs? And of course, the second thing is just how furious uh, will the public mood be? Now, I could see a series of events where there are huge demonstrations out in the street, mounting public anger, because, of course, being shut out of the decision making process for the second prime minister in a row. And of course, every prime minister that's followed David Cameron has come to power first, not through a general election, but because the Conservative party membership has imposed it on the country. I think if the public was really, really angry, and of course the lobby have turned, at least on this iteration of the Conservative Party, I think that the moral case quickly becomes a political case. But without that kind of outpouring of public anger, no, that there isn't going to be an incentive for calling a general election. And there aren't many mechanisms uh, for calling one which don't involve the acquiescence of the majority of the Conservative Party. If Boris Johnson is, you know, there is a sequence of events where he does become leader of the Conservative Party and Prime Minister again. I mean, I don't think it is the most likely, but it's definitely plausible. What happens then? Do you think they would recover in the polls to some degree? No, it would be a disaster. If you, if you, had, if you had Boris Johnson, Dominic Cummings, and the whole team got back together that won the general election in 2019... I'm sure they might recover. Well, they would recover because the numbers right now are so terrible. Yes. If you had absolutely outstanding people and all the jobs needed to run a sort of permanent campaign machine, yes. I mean, it, what's, what's clear, actually, is that Boris Johnson, under the thumb of his wife, fundamentally, which is one of the major reasons why Dominic Cummings had to go, was because of disagreements with, with Carrie Johnson, is a very different proposition to what he was when he won an 80-seat majority in 2019. So I, I don't really buy that. You know, I mean, the sort of the decadence and final months of the Johnson administration were a testament to that. And of course, another problem as well was the Tories, as we've seen with their whipping operation last night, are uniquely unhinged as a group of individuals. And it is like herding cats. And so you do need a highly disciplined leader, somebody who sets standards, somebody who really 
you know, drives a sense of probity from the top, at least rhetorically, and is credible when they say they want to do that. That's that's what you have to do when you've got MPs of the caliber of of what we see in the Conservative Party. So I I, I don't really see it. No. Um, what I would say is in regards to what Keir Starmer is uh, sort of hinting at in this whole situation is that it really does help Keir Starmer and particularly the Labour right. I'm not saying Keir Starmer is on the Labour right. I personally think he's, I think he's their man, but it really helps them. And if, if they want to sort of underwhelm, if they don't, if they think, look, we don't want to deliver too much. We don't want to shake the boat because they'll get into power. Decent majority. I mean, very decent if polls are to be believed by right now. Now, one school of thought, which I, I'm of, you know, and I think you guys are as well, it's much better to be in for one or two terms and actually shake things up and change things than to permanently say, well, you know what, actually, I want to keep my permanent majority and, and not do very much. Um, and I, I feel like the present situation really helps that second argument where you say, well, look, actually, no, we would love to do the public ownership stuff. We would love to be, you know, more radical in terms of, um, of workers' rights and of redistribution and of you know renewal and regenerating left behind uh, towns, regions, cities. We can't because we've got to be very sound with the nation's finances. Now, on the one hand, of course, that's that is true. That's inarguable. You can't say actually, Keir Starmer needs to come in. He needs to oversee a two hundred billion pound you know uh, plan of sort of fiscal stimulus, which is not funded. Of course not. He will need to um, be strategic in showing that Britain is going to not run a huge deficit um, in, a, in a way that will harm the, the, the nation's long-term credibility. So he can, for instance, as your guest last night, Michael, said, he can, for instance, borrow for capital investment. But for day-to-day -day spending, Labour won't be able to do that. Or should they? By the way, John McDonnell was committed to the same thing. But you can see a first Starmer term where, you know, he does some good things. They changed some trade union legislation. You know, they outlaw zero hours contracts. They maybe tweak some things with the electoral system. You know, they give the public sector like a tiny pay rise, not what they want, nowhere near inflation, but like 1% more than the Tories. You can see that being the tenor of a Starmer government. And of course, people were saying that six months ago, a year ago. But what's changed is that they can point to necessity and the markets. Quite credibly, I think, as well, actually. Yeah? So I think that's a really important thing for the left to think about now is what happens, what do we, what do you do when you're in a situation of a Labour government overseeing a very volatile economic situation, majority of maybe 100 or more? Um, how, how would you push them left on key areas? And what are your political priorities? You know, what are the two or three things that you really want to build a wider movement for, mass consensus for? Is it house building? Is it public ownership of rail? Is it a £15 minimum wage? And, and what order would you rank those priorities in? Very, very important questions, I think, for the left to be asking themselves right now, given the, the nature of Starmer's rhetoric in response to all of this. Johnson endorsement so far, Nadine Dorries, James Dudderidge. Michael Fabricant, Paul Bristow, Brendan Clark, Smith and Mark Longy. Um, only two of those particularly recognisable names. Nadine Doris and Michael Fabricant, truly the best of the best of the Conservative Party. Rishi Sunak, Angela Richardson has come out in favour of him and Penny Morden, Bob Seeley. Uh, we'll have to wait for some more of the big guns to declare. Um, Red 2 with a fiver. Here's to surfing on the never-ending maelstrom of chaos that is whatever the Tories happen to do in the last 10 minutes. All mod cons number two with £10 on this. Ash, the political significance of this, on the one hand, Liz Truss, very unpopular prime minister. She goes, lots of people will be celebrating this. At the same time, is there an extent to which, you know, all of this political change, which people don't actually have any input into, and especially also here, you've got the role of the financial markets. Is it disempowering watching all of this chaos and one prime minister being replaced by another, they're not really being any democratic input at all, apart from a very small group of Conservative Party members, and then the markets and some centrist Tory MPs. I mean, what, what kind of lesson should be drawn from this? What are we being taught about how the democratic process works? I think that the lessons from this, which will be taken up by the Labour right and also by the lobby, will probably be 
the wrong ones. So I think the lessons from this will be don't do anything which could spook the markets. Now, of course, there are very good reasons to take on uh, various wings of capital. You don't do it recklessly like Liz Trust did. But I think looking at the stranglehold that financialization has had on our politics and public life and delivery of public services for you know the last four decades, it is wholly legitimate to go, well, we're going to have to take this on and we're going to have to change it. You don't do it in a way which I think you know throws pension funds to the wolves necessarily. But what we know about the uh, 2017 and 2019 manifestos is that, yes, they were fully costed. Yes, it was borrowing to invest and not borrowing for day to day spending, but there would have been sections of capital which would have been unhappy with things like the nationalization programs, stuff like um, workers on boards and the gradual expropriation of uh, corporations. And you need governments which are willing to weather it. So I think taking the lesson from this while well, never ever speak the markets is, of course, the wrong one. Uh, thinking about, well, why you're taking on wings of capital, I think is very important. And of course, there is a deep and delicious irony in a avowed free marketeer being brought low because the markets hated her financial policy, right? That is oh, beautiful, delicious. I could eat a whole plate of it. I think in terms of the democratic question, when the conservative leadership election was going on, and it was very obvious that it was going to come down to Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak, I was on LBC's cross question with uh, Sebastian Payne from the Financial Times, um, someone from a Tory think tank who looked about 12 years old, and of course, Ian Dale. And I made the incredibly facile point that it is the norm in British politics for prime ministers to be imposed on the country without first having to test themselves at a general election. And that means that we don't often get the best prime ministers. The electorate is shut out from deciding the most fundamental social, political and economic questions of the day. And that's wrong. The answer from Sebastian Payne was a rather patronising, well, Ash, that's just our parliamentary system. As if systems aren't designed, as if they can't be changed, and as if they don't have better or worse outcomes for the public at large. And I think that the mood amongst the lobby at the moment isn't necessarily one uh, of, you know, the the fundamentals need to be returned to the people. When you look at how Jeremy Hunt was being received by the likes of, say, Aisha Hazarika, the mood was, well, the grown-ups are back in the room. Now, the question of whether or not there was actually a mandate to renew austerity and impose it on the country uh, was almost booted into row Z. So I don't have a huge amount of faith in political media in addressing these questions with the seriousness and the rigor that they deserve. But I think that the moral case for a general election is very strong. And if there is organizing being done, uh, which gets a significant presence of people out in the street, I think it then becomes inignorable, even by the ostrich the ostriches at the Westminster lobby. Uh, another update, Jonathan Riley, The Sun's Westminster editor. I'm told Boris Johnson is making plans to cut short his holiday. He hopes to be on a flight back to the UK this evening from the Dominican Republic. This guy is not giving up. We will have more details tomorrow. The, the final thing I want from both of you, Ash and Aaron, is a prediction. If there are two candidates who go to the Tory party membership, who will they be? I think it's going to be a bit of a stitch up to put the two most boring candidates in front of the Tory selectorate. So I think Rishi Sunak is a definite. It depends on whether uh, Ben Wallace runs, whether Penny Mordaunt runs, but I think it could, could come down to the two of them. It'll be interesting to see what happens if or when Boris Johnson throws his hat into the ring. Will he be blocked by his own MPs and what will he do following that? I think that's a live question. But I think that there will be a concerted attempt on the part of Tory backbenchers to limit the choices put in front of the Tory party membership. Aaron? I agree with Ash, firstly. I think Boris Johnson is the sort of chaos variable here. 
I think it's really easy to focus on um, how poor Liz Truss is, and she is, she's appalling, uh, and how poor many prime ministers have been over the last decade. But what's really important to understand here is that what underpins all of this chaos in British politics is an economy which doesn't increase living standards or produce growth. If the economy was growing, Liz Truss could have done these tax cuts, right? She could have. And it wouldn't have catalyzed or provoked this kind of response from the markets. And that's the exact same thing which is now going to underpin uh, the problems and the challenges confronting a Labour government under Keir Starmer. Keir Starmer will perhaps come to power with a manifesto, even if it's quite limited, saying he'll do certain things, public ownership of rail, pay increases for public sector workers, whatever. And the point is, again, if you don't have growth, and if you don't have growth and you have high inflation, you can't, you can't do it. You can't do it. Unless you have a massive redistribution of wealth, you can't do it. And this is going to underpin, I think, massive volatility and turbulence in British politics for a really long time. Because you have, on the one hand, the Conservative Party with homeowners, big business, pensioners, they're stakeholders, right? And they have to look after their people. Uh, and they've been able to do that through a mix of low interest rates and tax cuts. Um, and the economy was growing to, to, to some extent, less so over the last sort of uh, 12 years, but it was still growing to some extent through to 2016. It, it was beginning to recover after 2008. Meanwhile, with Labour, you've got the public sector, you've got a bunch of quasi-interest groups, organised Labour historically, where you know they're your stakeholders and the dividend of growth means you reward them. With no growth, you have a situation where neither party can really generate consent with the social demographics that they've historically relied on. That is a problem, and it underpins all the volatility. It's very easy to focus on the personalities. And of course, my God, look at Liz Truss. You should focus on the personality. She's incredibly strange, and it turned out a useless prime minister. But this isn't going away until we have growth. Then my second point, and it goes to what Ash was saying in regards to the pundits will invariably arrive at the wrong conclusion. They will say, well, this is because we need less democracy. Liz Truss is the Tory Corbyn. She should never have been prime minister. We should take power away from people, not give it to them. I mean, my God, you couldn't, you couldn't have a worse set of conclusions given the last six, seven years in, in British politics. I would actually argue to the contrary, say, no, it's an argument for more democracy. What the hell am I talking about? Well, I think if we had a proportional representation system in this country, a PR system, you don't get a hard Brexit because you need to bring together a bunch of stakeholders in a, in a coalition government where they agree on a consensus. You don't get a hard Brexit. You don't get the sort of shenanigans of, of, of 2019. Boris Johnson, when he goes, he would have gone because people wouldn't have had confidence in him as a prime minister anymore, would have been replaced by somebody else. And again, there would have been a consensus amongst a group of, of parties, a coalition. Um, and I said, well, we only have confidence in this government if this person leads the government. You wouldn't have somebody like Liz Truss. So the idea that looking at Johnson, looking at Brexit, looking at Truss, you say, the problem is we've got too much democracy. No, the problem is first past the post, the Westminster system, and a rejection and repudiation consistently by conservatives and pundits in this country of embracing modernity. Let's be a 21st century country. Let's have a democratic electoral system and a written constitution. That would really alleviate Many of these problems, but sadly, our establishment is committed fundamentally to rejecting common sense. In terms of the two candidates who make the runoff, I will say Sunak plus one, and I think it'll be a stitch up fundamentally. But like Ash says, uh, the, the sort of chaos variable here is, is Boris Johnson. And that is something that the Tory establishment probably doesn't welcome. Um, well, we'll see soon enough. I'm glad you made that extra point. That was all, I think, very, very important to remember that this is all taking place within much more important longer term trends and more significant ones than just, you know, who's up and who's down in the Conservative Party. Although on that front, I mean, I think I agree with both of you. I don't think Boris Johnson will get to the last round because I think he'd probably win. I think, you know, I, I think probably you will get Rishi Sunak and someone like Penny Morden. That's the only way I think you could probably unite the party behind a stitch up, behind excluding someone like Boris Johnson and either of them winning would be somewhat acceptable, I think, to Conservative MPs. Um, we'll be back tomorrow night. I'll be with Aaron Bastani. We'll be talking about lots more of those very significant structural trends in British politics that are making it completely insane at the moment for now. Ash and Aaron, thank you so much for joining me this afternoon. Thank you, Michael. Thank you so much. 
and thank you for tuning in. This has been another busy one. We'll be back tomorrow at 7 p.m.